and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the mastermind and mad genius behind DSX Machina Games, and the guy who's coming back with another vo with another volume of Amethyst, and f that has managed to get funded in le in about 90 minutes, and is currently way over its initial goal. Uh, the one and only Chris Diaz. Hello, my brother. How you, how you doing today, man? I'm doing well. <laughs> uh, bit of an bit of an aside, but th but thanks for leaving a comment on the video regarding the whole the whole stone phoenix incident i really didn't <laughs> want to make that video but i had to what was that one about i can't i'm trying to remember now when it, when everybody when everybody was when all the stuff was coming out regarding regarding sto regarding um regarding stone and phoenix oh so t yes, oh yeah yeah oh um, you say stone and phoenix so i'm like is that some kind of role playing game i don't know no. about and you go oh oh that yeah, yeah. No, me and Paco with the GMS podcast, we talk about that at length. Yeah, I, oh. um, the sole reason I ended up making that video was because, was because once all that stuff went down, I felt that it was inevitable that somebody was going to, going to dig around and see the two interviews that I had with him and, th mm. and think that I had endorsed all that stuff. So I right, decided right, to yeah. head that yeah. off at the pass. Yeah, but then ultimately like I said, I don't think you needed to apologize to anyone but you know that's just my opinion um yeah it was it was less of an apology and more of me voicing my dis voicing my disapproval and of course then they then they managed to make things worse for themselves and now everybody's mad at them oh um, yeah that's uh yeah because that because i apology. hope i'm successful enough to to bury my career like that <laughs> um I haven't seen I haven't seen a career burial that thorough since the rise and fall of Antonio Clown. Who the hell is? Um, Antonio Brown, we, who has been nicknamed on the show Antonio Clown or ABC, i.e. Antonio Brown the Clown. He was a really ta he was a really talented footballer who managed to completely torpedo his career. Ah, gotcha. Not through, not through any, not through any controversy or saying the wrong thing or anything like that, but just the good old fashioned being a fucking idiot. Ah, one of those. <laughs> um, which is actually refreshing in a weird way. So, I think we, t I think the first time that I had you on, we did touch a bit on Amethyst, but because I was trying to cover everything at once, we weren't able to go into a whole lot of detail. Um. I'm curious how Amethyst got started. Was it a case of a campaign setting that you were running that just get that just um evolved into a whole new beast or was it something else? Well, actually you hit the nail on the head about that specific terminology. Uh some people that I talked to about it kind of make the assumption that it's like a Doc Brown moment. I just like woke up one day and I just, or, or I slam my head and I wake up and the entire thing hits my head and like bursts from my head like uh, Athena from the head of Zeus. And it wasn't that way. It was uh, back when I was really young. I, I wanted to be an author. I still want to be an author, but I had a like a, a booklet of all the books I was going to write. Like, you know, you, I think every author when they're young probably has their little the little outline their little notebook and it's like oh i have like a hundred novel ideas in here uh, one of them was called amethyst and it was a post-apocalyptic semi-fantasy where dragons had returned to the world and the rest of humanity was walled in 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 walled cities um and outside the world was just a dragon infested wasteland mm -hmm. and that was the idea and i was thinking of how i was going to tell the story i had some ideas in my head and i had a couple scenes in my mind uh, and then the film reign of fire came out you know, idea how long ago this was. And I'm like, well, there goes that idea. Someone else took it. Now, that, that being said, that was it didn't have the, the, the walled cities. Uh, it was just post-apocalyptic with dragons. 
mm-hmm. but it was still close enough. And then we advanced a few more years, and th- uh, third edition D and D's come out, and a friend of mine's like, "Hey, I want to run a D and D. I want to run a D and D game. I need you to create a setting and run it for me. Mm-hmm. I want to be a player." And I'm like, oh, "Okay, sure." And so I read the system, and I'm like, "Okay." Um, uh, and of course, I always create things original content. I'm not interested in, in playing in someone else's sandbox. So, okay, do I have any fantasy stories in my notebook? Well, I just have the one. So we have the walled cities. It's set in the future. So instead of just being dragons, it's all of D and D pantheon outside of these the walls of these cities, and it's set on the real real Earth. And that's how we kind of got the ball rolling. And that's how it was for six months. We got our group together, started playing, and there was something itching about the setting, something that I didn't that didn't work for me. And one of them was I couldn't absolve why there was a division in magic and technology. Um, if you had magic, then you would need technology. If you had technology, you would need magic. It's one of those situations where there's a there's a philosophical issue at stake. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Dave Fiddler, um, at work, and I said, oh, I'm running a new game. And he said, oh, cool, what is it? And we hadn't played in a long time. And I said, well, it's a techno fantasy, but it's a setting where the rules of technology and magic don't actually interact. In fact, they actively disrupt each other. And he said, hey, that's, that's interesting. And I said, yes, because that idea didn't exist until it came out of my mouth at that moment. And so I went back to my group and I said, okay, we're going to retcon the city a little bit to have it make sense. So we're going to create this disruption where magic disrupts technology. And that gives us the reason why there are walled cities of technology and everywhere else is traditional fantasy. Everyone liked that, but one person who was already running a techno magic character, uh, they they were also heavily cheating, and then they eventually quit the group. But that idea stuck. Over the and then sometime in two thousand six, uh, I decided I wanted to publish the game professionally. Uh, I had been using just art I'd found online. Uh, I did something very interesting, and I asked permission. I know that's a freaky thing uh, from artists, so I could use their artwork in my free homebrew game. Uh, so many of them were like, "You're asking me." sure but thank you for asking no one ever asks they just take artwork for their own websites and i'm like well no I'm, a, I'm an artist i'm a creator so i get it uh and one of them was an artist named nick greenwood uh when i decided to make amethyst professionally i approached all these artists and say hey you want to work for me to do something legit something based off of the setting that your artwork was inspiring uh, a few uh, quite a few of them couldn't make it work from their schedule uh, a few of them were like, hey, it's great. I don't do black and white, though, which at the time I needed. Here's all my rates. So I'm like, oh, well, I can't afford that, especially if it's if it's just full color. And then I got this guy, Nick Greenwood, who was the only person at the time that was willing to do black and white. And um, I hired a bunch of artists, and he ended up being such uh, a phenomenon that it ended up being just him for the, the our project. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how it happened. Now, when, the, when Amethyst, the original 2008 version, came out, there was still a few things that weren't solidified. Uh, like one of the big aspects of the setting Le- leading up to publication we still had all the old D&D pantheon of gods and then when I went to publication for the 2008 version uh, I realized I couldn't do that so we had to make the setting agnostic because it was set in the real world and we don't want to acknowledge our religion as being right so we had to make the setting agnostic and then <clears throat> it was after the game got published and we started working on a reboot for 4th edition under Goodman Games when I decided that um I was having a conversation with my friend, and we're, I was trying to figure out something that was wasn't working for me. Mm-hmm. And it was about the 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 the, the separation of, of of order and chaos. And I, I'm not entirely sure if it's entirely the fault of um, Games Workshop, but it's always been assumed that uh, the forces of darkness, demons, came from a world of chaos. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of what. This, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we if we spun that around? What if? chaos was life in all forms if creatures like gibbering mouthers and dragons and elves were actually products of chaos which would make more sense if you were creating life in every possible combination including monsters that would be a force of positive magic of chaos magic Mm -hmm. and therefore the forces of evil would be the forces of century low entropy or is it high entropy i always get those confused where it's the forces of order of corruption and that created a very interesting tangent It, it it skewed how we were presenting our villains and it created a very interesting, some interesting philosophical point because we also realized that wait a second, that means the good magic, the chaos magic, the magic everyone uses, the magic that the elves rely on to survive, is technically because it's high chaos, 
it is technically encouraging the heat death of the universe because the universe is moving towards, um, I think, high entropy, high chaos. And and the forces of order, of corruption, which is it, it kind of assumed to be evil, that's actually encouraging immortality, true immortality. The, the universe can be held in a, in, a, in a static state. It would never, ever grow old. And so it became this double standard. And I thought oh, that's that's infinitely more interesting, and that's when Amethyst started to form. But it's it it started in in the mid '90s with this one idea, and it took 15 years before we got to a point where it was, it, it was really complete. And every version of Amethyst, even up to the fifth edition, it's never been a 100% replication of what I think Amethyst is. The original the 08 version of Amethyst was probably 60, 70%. Uh, the fourth edition version was probably seven or eighty. Well, the fifth edition version is about ninety-five percent, and Revelations is is an add-on, but it, it's it's designed to push it officially into being completely canonically what I'd like Amethyst to be. Mm -hmm. And it is kind of funny that you mentioned what, you mentioned wanting to be a writer because one one particular um, reward for the, for this current Kickstarter is the three novels. Mm -hmm. um, Aiden's Way, Controlling Chaos, and Hallowed Kingdom. Yeah. Um, what, pr what, prompted writing the, what prompted the writing of those three um, novels? Was it, ju was it just some... Was it a conversion of campaigns that you had done at your table, or was it ideas that you wanted to explore but didn't quite fit in the TTRPG end of things? A little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. What's interesting is that the the majority of my um, of my novels are based off of running campaigns. So mm -hmm. there's actually a conversation I had with somebody recently about this. Um, the Amethyst novels are based off of my campaigns, uh, and the players, the characters in my story, are inspired loosely off of the original characters that were in that game. And one of my players made a passing comment that their character was in my story. And I had to explain to him from a legal standpoint, no, 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 it's not. Beyond the fact that you created a character from my story, which means it's not something you own. Uh, this character, even you have admitted, does not act or look anything like your character. This character is inspired by somebody you created, but it is not your character. So... Uh, and not even the same events, because uh, the campaign was a very traditional dungeon romp. There was dungeons, there was traveling, and there's dragons on occasion. Mm -hmm. So, and I wanted the novels to be a bit more of a story. So, while it takes it as a jumping ground, there's a lot of, um, like, for example, the novel, uh, the first novel opens up introducing Aiden when he was a child, and there's a whole introductory story of him going to Limshow, finding these artifacts, and so forth. The campaign actually started with a traditional tavern meeting, which is what you know, every game starts with, with a tavern meeting. And that scene in the novel occurs about 70% in. So everything before that is completely f manufactured, right? And even the second novel, uh, Controlling Chaos, uh, is entirely fictional. Entirely fictional. Uh, because the group separates... Um, in the novel very early on and it was actually inspired by the fact that the pl one player left the group for about six months so that character literally wasn't there so the entire story is an entire fabrication of that character actually do leaving the party and then going off in a different direction so once again it was inspired by it but we never role played what that character was doing for those six months that player was away mm -hmm. so I, I decided to write that story now um interestingly my last project affinity which is a triple setting. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, the novel is also based very loosely off of my campaign, but it was a campaign that only ran for like three sessions, and we never played with the other two settings. So it's once again, there's only one part of it, and the characters were heavily, heavily readdressed. Um, I did name the characters in Aiden's Way uh, after the, the original characters in the game, uh, but in all the other instances, I create entirely new characters that in some situations are completely unrecognizable to the original characters the players made. So both Amethyst, Affinity, uh, most of my, other than a few of the projects, but Amethyst is heavily inspired. I don't know if that's going to stay that way, but I've been looking at my outline, and oddly enough, the novel outline, although different things will happen, 
the characters still have to go certain places for certain plot points to activate. So it's going to feel, feel if, if my players ever read these books, it'll feel similar, but in truth, it's a very, very different story than what they encountered. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind, when it comes, when it comes to the when it com for a lot of people, I think the intro I think the um, at least for me, the, one of the big in one of the big um, points of interest, I guess, is the best way for me to put it. Mm. Would you believe English is my first language? Is the fa is I ain't much for fancy book learning. <laughs> is the is is the techno part of the um tech part of the techno magic yeah and something i'm something i'm curious about is is um when it came to des when it came to designing that a that aspect what the what the over what the overall goal was because i'm pretty sure you didn't want it just to just be to just be high fantasy with guns even in its, even in its early stages yeah. I mean, yeah, the thing is, is that when we originally ran the campaign, that is actually how things happened, right? I said, of Southern Modern Earth, there are these big, these big cities, but all the players were playing fantasy characters, because at the time, I hadn't created any of the tech characters. We weren't using D20 Modern. Uh, I'm not even sure if, it was, if, it, if that even existed. It might have existed at that point. But. 2000, um, 2008 is is when you said the original Amethyst came out? Yeah. Um, I'm talking about the original campaign. Yeah, the original... Uh, ca the, original... The, the, the later campaigns, because the 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 story that, that Amethyst is telling, the one that's uh, in the novels, uh, is that's the first of three campaigns. And so, in the later campaigns, I have kind of insisted on some tech element. Mm -hmm. So at least one character is playing a tech character. Yeah. And in a mixed party, which a lot of people... Seem to think uh, I was saying you couldn't have, and yet I, I must have missed out a, a point where I told people you absolutely can play a mixed party. It's it, that's the fun part is is mixing these groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I, I think I think some people came, came with the assumption that that was the case because of the um, degradation rules. Yeah, exactly. Uh, also, I also I double checked. D twenty Modern came out in two thousand two. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So I originally had, I, I had my original amethyst before then because I think it was in two thousand when I started running that. Mm -hmm. And but that being said, uh, there was no D twenty modern for fourth edition, and uh, a no. D twenty and a, a semi official D twenty modern only got thrown up on Kickstarter this year. So yeah, it was um, it was just me. It was just my every, yeah. We have everyday heroes is still on the way, and I and. In the interest of full disclosure, I did have one of the writers for that on on the show not too long ago. Um, it's interesting what they're doing. Um, yeah, I mean they're trying to, to 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 stick to. I guess I think I have to assume I was kind of intentionally keeping my distance because I didn't want people to say I was ripping them off, even though my books came out before them. Uh, but it's interesting that like there was never any D twenty Modern Fourth Edition, uh, Ultra Modern Four, the, the product that I, I put out mm -hmm. was basically the only option. And it's now interesting that we're now seeing a deluge, a deluge of non-fantasy 5e games. And I think that's very fascinating. And it's unfortunate because so many of these companies are, are, are throwing around a lot of money. And whenever I talk about uh, Amethyst or Ultra Modern, someone's like, oh, so like I had one guy accuse me of ripping off Arcana of the Ancients. Uh, the Numenera 5th edition book, right? Yeah. And I'm... If I'm be if I'm being honest, as somebody who's co who has talked about Numenera quite a bit and ran and ran a campaign that was that lasted like a year and a half, the com the com the comparisons of between Amethyst and Numenera are it's like it's like saying how much more black the Black Album and Spinal Tap can get. <laughs> Yeah. The answer is none, none more black. <laughs> but if I'm being if I'm being honest, in a, in all of my in all of my reviews, I've always tried to stray very very hard from call from calling something a ripoff. Yeah. 
Lar or or I don't even I don't even like using the term clone. Yeah. But even then it it doesn't make any sense too because when someone said that, it what bothered me is that the, the the person this happens all the time. I get I see these all the time on Facebook. People make a cursory examination. They kind of just gloss over it. Yeah, gloss over one bullet point and extract. And they go, from "Oh, that. you're a ripoff of Shadowrun." I'm like, "No, Shadowrun Cyberpunk. Where I'm not. I'm not Cyberpunk." And now I know people who have read Shadowrun because I actually haven't. I know the setting, but I haven't read the books. Uh, and and read Amethyst, and they're like, "I've read both of them. They're nothing alike." Yeah. And then I go to and people go, oh, "Oh, it's just it's, you know, someone hasn't seen or kind of the Ancients." I go, "Why would I bother? I predate that book." And they're like. And and someone was trying to make an argument that that there's no way we could have beaten Arcana of the Ancients because Arcana of the Ancients was fifth edition and I couldn't have made Amethyst for fifth edition. And I was just like, okay, first of all, if you did any research, if you did even a modicum, a thirty seconds of research, you know that Amethyst originally came out in two thousand and eight, four years before Numenera came out, and my fifth edition Amethyst came out in twenty sixteen. Four years before uh, Arcana of the Ancients came out, so on both points I beat them. But it's when you're dealing with big projects, it's not about who gets there first, who gets theirs biggest. Yeah. And, and that, it, it gets frustrating when you're when you're when you're a person like me, who's an independent person, that the one of the only few few claims of fame that I have is the fact that I was able to put out these products out before a lot of other people. A lot of people talk about cyberpunk. For fifth edition, and they bring, and, and I know if I ever do a, a reprint of uh, of Neurospasta, someone's going to say, "Oh, we already have Cyberpunk. We have this one." I go, "Yeah, except that my Neurospasta came out what three years before all of them. This is a reprint." I but a lot of people wholeheartedly you know, reject the idea that one that what that there should be one book to rule them all when it comes to a given subgenre. And if I'm being honest, a lot of the people who do who um who do that um. They some of them get real mad when I call when I, when they do that kind of stuff and then I say silence Linus, <laughs> go back go back to sucking on your thumb with your security blanket. Well, is, you're, a, you're, 100%, you're 100 percent you're 100 percent right you're 100 percent right and the thing that you, I, I'll, I'll even go double down on you because I uh, I'm not a I I don't have any loyalty to this but there is a there's a board game called Nemesis. Mm -hmm. The very felt it, it, it exploded on Kickstarter but God knows how many years ago. And I did a review for the Dice Tower when I was doing video for the Dice Tower. And I was, uh, the whole focus of the, of the video was talking about that whenever Nemesis got a lot of positive review, well, it's, it's massively loved, but everyone who posted a negative review said it was a, it was a kind of a rip off of Aliens. It, 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 it uh, it's completely unoriginal. It ripping off the IP without paying for it. And even the Tom Bassel's review said this is basically Aliens the board game. And then Shut Up and Sit Down even made fun of it, calling it Aliens the board game. And I'm like, you guys aren't a fan of the genre, are you? You like, you realize that, yes, after Alien came out, there was about a dozen movies that were blatantly trying to rip off Alien. But then there were some films that were legit good. Just because Alien did it first and did it best doesn't mean that it's now the only space alien horror story that we can tell. And whenever someone says like, "Oh no, um, Nemesis rip off of Aliens," I go, "No, actually, it's a rip off of the movie Pandorum." But you probably haven't seen Pandorum, so why are you making that argument? If you've seen the movie Pandorum and seen Nemesis, you're like, "Oh my God, they're totally ripping off Pandorum." <laughs> I may, but no one ever knows that. I may delve. In, I may delve into this in a little more detail in a vi in a video down the road. I'm mm. debate. I'm weighing my options, but. Whenever it comes to these sort of ripoff claims, I'm less interested in whether or not the ripoff is whether or not the claim is true or not. Most of the times, it isn't. Mm -hmm. I am far more interested in why someone someone would make that claim. Why they because and I've I've asked people this and I've never gotten a straight answer, which usually tells me that the argument is bullshit. And for, for anyone who for anyone who's a first time listener. And and is surprised at my cursing. Well, welcome to the show. This is what I do. I curse, I drink, <laughs> and I talk about games. But, I, I've been <laughs> drinking already, so. But what the question that I often ask, the question that I end up asking is, why do you consider that a ripoff? Because to claim something that is a, is a ripoff is to say that it is solely there to cash on the name. Um, Orca 
was Dino De Laurentiis trying to cash on the cash in on the popularity of Jaws. There's no getting oh, yeah. around that fact. No, yeah, we all know that. Um, and Alien does have ripoffs. It has Galaxy of Terror. It has Creature. These are films that would not exist. Look, if, if I were to list off all the all the um, films that came that were blatant ripoffs that came out of the Asylum. I'd be here for days. Oh, yeah, that's, and that's what a volume does. For me, like a ripoff is if you are clearly taking elements from something else, um, and and it's it's one of those situations where if it's like twenty thirty percent, it's inspired. If it's like sixty to seventy percent, it's based off of. If it's like eighty ninety percent, it's a ripoff. Yeah, and. So in that situation, maybe Pandorum is a based on, not a ripoff. Yeah, and I and whenever it come, whenever it come, I often I remember I remember once getting on somebody when they when they claim when they tried to pull the ripoff claim, and I was like, "Motherfucker, your favorite movie is John Carpenter's The Thing." Yeah, <laughs> which is itself is a remake. Yeah, a re a remake and bo and both are an adaptation of Who Goes There. Yeah. Um, like the, I've always I've always found the the thing that a lot of people consider ripoffs is something that I find fascinating of the chain of inspiration. Um, whenever I've talked about the issues that I have with, say, core fifth edition, I often bring up the things the things that inspired it and how the, and how so, and how there's kind of a evolutionary issue. I mm -hmm. I e. I e to use an example, last week I brought up, I was talking about the issues that I've had with the monk, as a as a class. Yeah, um, a lot of the inspirations for what would become the monk come from the Destroyer books, but what people think of when they think of the monk isn't those books. Most people haven't read those books. Yeah, they're thinking of Kung Fu, Wushu. Yeah, they're usually and usually usually. Usually, the understanding of kung fu that people had during that boom in the '70s, which makes perfect makes perfect sense. It was the style at the time, if you'll excuse the Simpsons joke. Yeah. But it's in it's in going through that 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 it makes it makes for a better understanding of how the how the class could develop into the problems that it did. Um. And. One thing, one thing that I, one thing that I'm always curious about, whenever you have, um, diff whenever you have different tech, different tech levels, in, in tabletop format, is it's very easy to have firearms outstrip, um, outstrip classical melee weapons. Well, technically, yeah. It's very, it's very easy to do. It's very easy to do that. Um, how do, you, how do you? How, I won't. For lack of a better term, how would you? How do you balance that out? The single mistake, and this is, I've had conversation, like really elevated conversations with people that insist that this has to be done a certain way. There is this arbitrary, there's this belief of of um, of damage scaling, of trying to apply realistic, real world physics to D and D, which you know and we know, and everyone who's intelligent knows this is impossible and ridiculous. It's it's a game for a very good reason. It can be you know, fun, you but if you but if you want that level of realism, there are other games you can be playing, like Riddle of Steel. Yeah, but the issue is that as a result, they make this claim: well, a gun does way more damage than a bow, therefore a gun needs to do four times more damage, and it's such a weird belief. And it permeates almost everybody. And I, every time they, I see it happen, they're always making that mistake. Well, a, bla a, a bow does one die ten, therefore a gun has to do two die ten. I go, wait, wait, wait. At what point did you see mathematically or physically proven that a gun, a pistol, a thirty, a thirty-eight caliber pistol, will do twice as much damage as a bow? Remember, there's there's a huge physical issue. A bullet travels at a much higher speed, but a bow has has a lot more mass. If you fire a bullet. And a bucket of sand, the bullet will stop about an inch in, but the bow will go right through it. Mm -hmm. And even if you take that into account, it's still ridiculous because you have to remember that, sure, 
they're always looking at the bow being the ranged weapon that does one die ten. And you figure out, like, you know that the great axe does one die twelve. Which means it's only marginally better than a bow. Now we both know that's BS. We know how much damage a bow could do to a person. We know how much damage a battle axe could do to a person. At the end of the day, these numbers are arbitrary. They were applied for game balance, not on not to be, not to become realistic. It's all about game balance. And we also know also that the critically big damage values are actually inflicted by your class and not by your weapon. Right, and we know, and that's how uh, a, a dagger can do forty points of damage in the hands of a rogue. And we we see these these effects come into come into play that that allows people to do insanely more damage than normal. And ultimately, that's that's the approach. And so people look, and I, I see people. And that's why I I don't show people a picture of my weapon damage tables on the. I did that once a years ago. And it caused a whole brouhaha where I'm like, guys, you're looking at the stats. You're not looking at what it really means. But of course, I wasn't telling them that. I just showed them the sheet going, look at all these guns. And everyone's like, why are they doing such little damage? And then the, it created this whole brouhaha of people challenging the fact that my weapons were too underpowered. I, and and yet I go, every single time I talk to people who play Ultramodern, which is where Amethyst took its rule, Ameth Amethyst, uh, Ultramodern took all of his rules from Amethyst, um, that they find the Tekken characters slightly overpowered. And how can you have underpowered weapons and overpowered characters? And that's because the characters define what is the actual high damage value. A sniper in the hands of a, of a gunslinger doesn't do very much, but a sniper weapon in the hands of a sniper can do a lot and a lot more. Uh, and just that's how it's supposed to. That's how D and D does it. Create your classes and create your rules to be thematically um, similar to how Wizards of the Coast does it for Fifth Edition, which is damage weapons are basically very close to each other. There's only like a four or five damage scale between the vast majority of the weapons, and then your class and your character does most of the actual heavy lifting. And so for Ultra Modern, which came from Am uh, Amethyst, it's the same way. Your class determines most of the most of how uh, your heavy lifting and the weapons are slowly incidental. And that's how you do it. And the fact that the fact that I have to explain that, and not, not, not as an insult to you, but the fact that people ask this question uh, and the fact that I still get, I still see so many people falling down that trope and and I've seen some people create the most the weird, most elaborate pretzel rules to try to justify high damage weapons that are balanced. And some people said, "Well, you just don't do it. You can't have guns. Simple as that." And I go, "Well, obviously that's, that's not going to work." And if, if if you don't mind me offering a bit of a crackpot theory, I have I have one little I have one little theory as to why you and why you end up seeing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, let's consider for the moment that D that D and D was born that D and D was born out of the college wargaming scene. Mm -hmm. Like you, you look at you look at a lot of those early contenders, and they were they were co they were college historical nerds. The right. same the same kind of people who I'd see who you, who you would see at um, SCA meetings. And some right. other kinds of reenactments, and that real that um, realism mindset is largely in, is largely ingrained in them, even if it doesn't, um, even if it doesn't make a lot of sense. In addition, to, in addition to that, I think a I think a lot of I think a lot of the folks um, who ha who have that who have that kind of mindset. Um, are conflating this idea of realism with game balance, and there's a reason why one of my mantras has always been believability over realism. Because mm -hmm. uh, making things as realistic as possible in a power fantasy, which is what role playing is, mm -hmm. is counterproductive. Yeah. Where, uh, and the attitude that I've always taken with with this with this whole guns thing is not is not making it that they're overpowered or underpowered or realistically powered i don't have any interest in that what i do have an interest in is is making it is making it so that it doesn't 
com so that one option doesn't become too useful. Uh, in other words, not falling into the same trap that um, Codzilla or now Cowzilla falls into when it comes to when it comes to that sort of balancing. Um, yeah, and I've seen and I've seen people do do that. I've seen, like I said, one guy who said, "Okay, well, guns do two die ten damage, but it only does two die ten above a certain character level." And I'm like, "Dude, that why why waste your time trying to justify?" what isn't realistic like the answer is there you just got to look at it but it's, it's amazing how many people try to force D, &D to being realistic and and you see that you always see this conversation about how does hit points reflect reality i go they don't they never have and someone and everyone always says well it's your capacity to avoid damage you're not always actually getting cut whenever you take damage you're it's just basically your ability to withstand damage i go yeah, that works in like a couple situations, but then there are scenarios where you should be freaking dead from what is clearly a direct attack and you shrug it off. Like, no, you are playing a superhuman in a world of superhumans. Just you accept want, it and move on. You want to know what's been my counter to that whole thing? Let's oh, no. uh, I usually ask the question, why are you why are you making so much of a fuss about hit points in this? And not wounds when you're playing Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Yeah. Just to use that as an example. Yeah. And I bring that up because, well, D and D D D evolved off of chainmail. Yeah. And once again, there are games that su that supply that kind of thing. But trying, but even even the t even when D and D tried to have a more a more real have tried to have more realistic uses of weapons. Like the weapon speed or the attack location stuff that was in AD and D second, they never stick because no. you're you're over you're overcomplicating these kind of things when part of the appeal is um, simplicity. Like if you if you want that level of complexity, you'd be better off playing something like Phoenix Command. I may be a little bit biased because Phoenix Command has been my whipping boy for years, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, or same thing goes with something like any of the Palladium games. I like Rifts as a setting. I hate running it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the, 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 what, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's really it's 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 so distressing to have great systems with bad rules, uh, and that's yeah. The, some of the best systems, some of the best settings have had some really crappy rule sets. And you can imagine how much I was laughing when I saw when I saw Rifts. Jump, jumping onto Savage Worlds, which is really natural, it, yeah, there is a line of Savage Worlds rifts um, and done I, by Palladium. Um, Palladium seems to Palladium seems to be in the position of of just being a glorified licensor these days. Oh, so they're not publishing the actual game. Somebody else, somebody else is a different studio is developing it. Same with the ah, Savage Worlds, okay. um, right. Robotech. Along with no, the... I saw that. Yeah, because I'm a I'm a big follower of Robotech, so I know that. But yeah. uh, Palladium Palladium lost the license on Robotech, so there's they don't there's there doesn't have to be any communication between Palladium and and the Savage World Robotech. I find interesting. There's actually two different Robotech games from different there publishers, are, but that's another point. Are. Um, I have but interview... Palladium likely owns the IP on Rifts because that's the original thing that they created. Yeah. So whoever's publishing it has to actually, like I said, IP holders pay these guys to publish. Um, um, a, a new version of Rifts. Mm -hmm. So I found that very interesting. Yeah, I I, I found it to be a glor to be a glorious comedy. Um, Why is that? Because because of because of how overly defensive CM Beta was. If 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 anybody was making hacks of his system. Ah, okay. Um, that and um, I that and this was this was coming off of the. I found out about this shortly after he ended up pissing off everybody with that second wave of Robotech tactics that never happened. Oh, trust me, I know that very well. I did a <laughs> ninety minute I did a oh, ninety minute or sixty minute video on my YouTube channel all about Robotech. Yeah. And give and given given some of the stuff that um b that Bill Coffin had shared back in two thousand five, maybe I know that was only one side of the story, but I got the feeling it was um, somewhat accurate. <laughs> mm -hmm. um. Well, like I said, there's, there's, there is, 
um, there is another layer to that story that Sambita failed miserably to try to convey. Like there was a way for him to spin that in in a way that people might have given him a pass, but he botched it so badly, like so unbelievably badly that he could not spin his way out of it. And I, when I read the story and read some of the backstory, I was just like, dude, the answer was right there. Like you could have easily spun this in your favor. You, you just got to throw another company under the bus because it was their fault, not yours. But Another you didn't. company that has a res that has a respectable um, his history when it comes to their own stuff. No, 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 not at all. The, 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 basically, the, the, a lot of the fault of the Robotech RPG Tactics was based off of Ninja Theory, which is a miniature company that nobody respects Ninja, anymore because Nin Palladium. Ninja Ninja Division, thank you. Ninja Theory is a video game company. Uh, was all be and they they have no rep no reputation anymore because they've screwed over so many other miniature Kickstarters, including Paizo with their Pathfinder miniature line. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like I said, if if Sabita just threw Ninja Division under the bus, um, he could have withered some of that 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 issue. I mean, he wouldn't have been hundred percent out, but at least he could have done a better job. Yeah. And the fact that nobody knows about this other side of the story just shows you how badly he he handled the PR of that. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. But what as an as an aside, when it come when it came to when it came when it came to the class when it came to the class design, just getting back on the rails when it comes to Amethyst. Sorry, yeah. Sorry for getting off the rails. We tend to do that okay. here. Um. When it came, when it comes to the canon classes, as as you referred to it, were there any that were were there any in your opinion that were easier or trick or trickier to adapt into Amethyst's world? You mean the fantasy classes or yeah. the tech class? Uh, the fantasy yes. classes, because the tech classes are all are all your own essentially. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's a very good question, actually. the The biggest issue was. Um, well, the first one was the fact that I took gods out of the story, so I had to find a way for clerics to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a couple ways to make it work, or if someone's playing their own game, they could just ignore it and do what they want. But I, I had to create a way for clerics to work without proof of a divinity. And that was that was that was challenging. Uh, also, in canonical Amethyst, there are no clerics, so it's one of those situations where I'm kind of squeezing the setting. And in the Revelations, I, I give a more complicated explanation as to that. Uh, wizards, of course, were also a thing because wizards have their own Vancian magic system, which is not compatible with uh, the actual canonical magic system. But I twisted my setting so people could use the traditional Vancian magic system with wizard. However, I threw in a few caveats based off of the way magic does work. So I kind of made this chimera that made it work. In Revelations, we're going to be creating a new magic spellcasting system that is 100% canonical to the setting. Uh, yeah. And then... So it became that, and then the other thing is that um, Amethyst is 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 actually high in magic, but not high in spellcasters. So there's a there are there are magical beasts everywhere. Not a lot of magical items, but not a lot of spellcasters. Uh, so it, there's magic permeating the setting, but it's not uh, overtly aggressive like I, in a Harry Potter level. So in D and D, almost half the classes are either magical or or directly have spellcasting. Ranger, paladin, bard, wizard, sorcerer are all spellcasters. And I've always had issues with that. And that's one thing I enjoyed and appreciated with 4th edition is that they peeled off and took away the inherent magic abilities of things like the ranger. Um, one of the things I'm doing... Uh, Say it louder for those in the back. <laughs> one of the things I plan on doing with uh, the revelations, we just actually unlocked it. Uh, or have we? I think we've either unlocked it or we're about to unlock it, uh, where it is creating six new fantasy classes um, that are you can use in any game, but they're being presented in Amethyst as being canonical. And so it's a non-magical paladin, non-magical ranger, non-spellcrafting bard, splitting rogue into two very distinctive classes, a thief and, and, and an assassin. Um, and, and like, for example leaning in on the things that people remember historically about what a paladin might be. Mm -hmm. So 
ego plays into it to lean in on the on what people remember paladin being in second edition being very egotistical leaning in on that without making them magical without giving them magic to back their play so a paladin is just egotistical for egotistical sake they they have a faith in god but they don't really have god's god doesn't have their back as a reality um and then giving people new ways of 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 addressing these new characters and and if they want to create a low magic setting even if it's not amethyst they can pull these classes and go great now we have non-magical versions of all these classes uh, which i'm sure a lot of people have done but this is just my interpretation because i want to play with the format so yeah so cleric any spellcasting cl class um has always been an issue and and even monk i'm like monk monk's a mess in any any magical setting uh that's why in, in with the with ultra modern we had the martial artist and that's why I don't need to create a, a new variation of monk because I made that with the martial artist, a non-magical martial artist guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's it, the overtly the overt amount of just aggressive magic outside of spellcasting always bothered me. Mm -hmm. So that's that, that was one of the things I had to try to work around. And with uh, original quintessence, I didn't really work around. I gave people excuses to make those classes work. Where in revelations, I'm thinking you can still use those excuses, or here you can use the actual canonical class. And when it came now, you mentioned you mentioned coming up with a new uh, magic system that's canonical to the to the setting of Amethyst. Mm -hmm. um, what can you tell me about how how that would work? Because obviously, it's not using the Vancean model. I was able to pin that down pretty quickly. Well, that it's a very good point because the. I just came off of doing a setting uh, called uh, Affinity, and Affinity was three different settings. One was high fantasy, one was steampunk, and the other one was science fiction. And we actually got far in the campaign enough that we unlocked variant magic systems. And I already had an idea what I was going to do with them, but I wanted to, to see how I could break the mold and think outside the box. The way I think outside the box was thinking outside of D&D, not looking at the D&D mechanics, but think, things I can see from other games specifically board games, and go, okay, can or video games, can I incorporate what I'm seeing there and add that into D&D? Can I make that work? So with the steampunk setting Taurus, I create a magic system that involves deck building. Uh, so you, so the player ha has a deck of specific uh, cards that have a, a 52 standard deck. And as they, cre as they create their character, they can remove cards, add cards. And then they also have spells, but that spells are very much based off the power level of these cards. When we went to uh, the fantasy one, it was a bit more traditional. There were spell levels, but it was all about if you can you can cast any spell as long as you had the money to pay for the re resources to it. And guess what? At first level, you're never getting the money to buy to buy the the, the components required for a big spell. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when we got to Conestoga, the sci-fi one, I didn't want any of that at all. I wanted it to be entirely. Um, non spellcrafty psionic style magic. So I created a sphere grid system that we see a lot in, in Final Fantasy games and some first person shooters, where you're basically moving through a tree, unlocking abilities. And then, so instead of having 30 spells, you actually only have four or five that you're trying to make better. And as you go through this, you can take, you can swap these spells out, but at most, you'll only have four spells, but you can use them a lot. Uh, and you get to adjust them, but they're not spells, they're not spell levels, you just gain this this superpower. Uh, and that that's how Conestoga does it. Looking into uh, the new Amethyst one, I want to take what I learned and see and look around at the other rules that other games are doing and go, is there something cool that I can make work? Can I, you know, like in, in Ultra Modern, the redo version, I introduced a, a character class that uses a, a, a dice bag. And that's a completely weird mechanic. There's nothing in D&D that ha has that. That's very much a board game idea. And I want to see about what other neat board game mechanics out there could I incorporate into something interesting to make a, a character class different. And so with the Magic and Amethyst, the spellcasting system, uh, it's very meant to be chaotic. So it is in the stories, we know that the anything you cast a spell, anything you cast is alive in some way there's no magic missile and if you cast a fireball what you're carrying is more like a fire elemental and the more energy you put into it the, the more anthropomorphic it becomes in the end of the first book aiden creates a kind of a lightning beast and so that's how the magic system kind of works so 
it's never about I'm gonna say this spell and I'm gonna cast this spell and do this. I'm gonna be like, no, I'm gonna say this word and create something from nothing. And that's basically what the magic system is going to be about is is having this power to create autonomous beings out of thin air, whether it be made of fire or lightning or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, that is basically the crux of the Amethyst magic system um, is the fact that you cast a spell and now for the length of that battle, you have a electric, el you have a lightning elemental at your disposal. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. That's that. So, but how it's actually going to uh, manifest mechanically, I haven't decided yet. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, with Revelations, you're expanding into, at the very least, Europe. Um, compared to Eastern Europe and maybe Africa as well. I think we're close to unlocking that as well. Now, compared to the compared to the sta the state of things in the Americas. What can you tell me about the state of things in Am in Amethyst when it comes to what um, Europe ends up looking like? Well, um, the interesting thing is that the setting is com like we've the setting is so detailed and really uh, kind of outlined. We already have, um, or I already have all of the entire world basically defined. Mm -hmm. And for Europe, Europe is concentrated. So it has the same amount of magic, the same amount of, of, of kind of uh, activity, but condensed in a space about a quarter of the size. Uh, and that's primarily the, the issue moving into the setting of the fact that uh, everyone's very close to each other. Uh, kingdoms are very close to each other. And now in, in, in America, they're very spread out. There's a lot of room to breathe. In Europe, there is no room to breathe. We have several kingdoms. We've got three bastions. Um, they're very unique bastions, and they're all rubbing against, against each other. We have the Empire of Dragons. We have the most technically advanced nation on the planet, which is Porto, uh, which is in Portugal. And so we have extremes. We have the most powerful magic and the most powerful tech on the same continent that's in its landmass that's a half or a quarter of the size of North America. Uh, and, then, and then we have Africa. Africa is... Um, uh, kind of, I wouldn't say lawless per se, but there's there's very few kingdoms there because magic saturation had cre has created a a very hostile landscape. Um, almost all the deserts are basically vibrating and constantly in motion, so there's basically oceans of sand. So there's a whole campaign world that's just Africa that's very unique that's seen nowhere else. Uh, you have sand boats, you have sand submersibles, and it's uh, it's very much a um, a kind of outlandish sub fantasy setting that's isolated just just this one continent. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in with that in mind, given the given the detail of the setting, whenever there's detailed settings, sometimes sometimes there's the risk of going too detailed and creating a kind of continuity lockout. Um. I'd say one one of the bigger offenders of of this kind of thing is on some on some levels on some levels BattleTech. It's the reason why I've never been fond of of any of the RPG runs with with BattleTech and stick to the war game. Um, and another 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 big example can be Sh can be Shadowrun at times. Mm. Ha when it comes to have you made sure that even with the detail with with the setting that it that it isn't a pl isn't in a situation where it'd be hard to slot in the player characters of a given table well um what was interesting is that um how can i explain this the the Am Amethyst was really designed to do that. The Amethyst was, was really designed to be a setting that you can slot um, your own characters into, because that's how it was originally conceived. And um, because it was a very, very big universe. And as I've moved to sitting along, it's been more and more defined. Like before, I mean, you could be any class you want. You could be any race you want. And as we, I've progressed the setting, I've made less compromises for players. So, the, but I wouldn't say it's getting more difficult. But because at the end of the day, I'm, I never tell GMs how to 
how to how to play their games. I never tell players how to play their games. If you're in my game and if I'm running a game, I'm definitely telling you how to play, and I'm definitely telling you what to do because it's my game and I'm God. But in your games, uh, it's however you wish to play it, and so you can ignore. I know people that have said I play Amethyst, but I have a Tiefling. I go, that's fine. That's your setting. You do it how you wish. So, and some people have taken half the setting and they played around with the rest of it. And some people do go full canonical, and um, that is entirely their choice. So I think there's still a lot of freedom within the setting if you go 100% canonical to the setting. But since almost everybody I know plays with it in some way, uh, it's there. I mean, it's it's yes, it's in it's in it's in pen uh, to coin a phrase in the book. It's hard defined in the book. But the moment it, it lifts off the page into someone's mind, at that point, it becomes pencil, and you can it can be erased and changed. So, from my in my opinion, the I I like give people stories, I give people ideas, and uh, most GMs, I used to give people big open canvases, like big blank sheets of white, and say, figure out what you want to do here. And a lot of people said, no, 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 please give us the stuff. We don't have an imagination. We want you to give us the stuff. And factions was was that basically saying, okay. All this setting stuff that you asked, here are all the answers. And that's why a good chunk of factions is exploring the same space that the first game did, but with just a lot more detail. It says, this city that we just mentioned, guess what? There's a page to have a history to this city. And here and here and here it is. And we're going into Revelations, we're gonna be doing that same thing. Because it gives you that lore to play with. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh so it gives you the framework. But at the end of the day, like for me, I never created uh a dungeon. I always bought the dungeons off somebody else. I always grab the dungeon and say, okay, we're going to run this dungeon. And then the players, as they go into it, I just slightly adjust it. Maybe 5 or 10% skew on the storyline. And boom, it slots, it fits perfectly. It just plugs right into the setting. And yeah, I, I, I was playing with a lot of classic, classic first edition modules when I ran Amethyst back in 2003. Um, my players got so invested in the story we started doing dungeons less and less until the last campaign we didn't do any at all but in the first campaign we do at least one dungeon per season of the game and i never ever 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 created one whole cloth i'm way too lazy for that there's lots of really great adventures out there i grabbed somebody else's and i just changed it so instead of seeing an elf you saw a ladinian instead of a black dragon it's a death dragon mm -hmm. Outside of the little bit of wording, everything fell into place. It was maybe five or ten percent of, of of wording. That being said, I never like tried to adapt Curse of Strahd. I never tried to do to adapt any of the really deeply lore specific adventures. But there's a thousand adventures out there that are completely agnostic to any setting that I can pull from. Mm -hmm. Now, the one one thing that I no one thing that I noted is the is the amount is the sheer amount of. Um, amount of content when when some people are some people are trying to stick to a 250 page page rule you have you have um quintessence was 400 plus um factions 450 plus and you're sh you're probably going to be shooting for a similar amount with revelations if I potentially <laughs> and has the even even with that, has there been has there been a, has there been a case where where um where anybody anybody's told you there's too much stuff or or is it a case of just writing until you can't until you um stop? Well, that's no, I I never have my obviously I have a problem uh, trying to keep to a budget. Uh, Affinity was supposed to be 350 page books and there were three 260 page books, so I I, I know how these things happen. And for me, I always like giving value for money. I don't know. I've never had anyone ever tell me directly the like, problem with the setting is that it's too big. I know some people have said like you know the font may be too small, which is something we fixed in the first book, or you know it's just like it's it's dense. Like there's, there's a lot of narrative and it's dense, but no one ever said the book was too big. That being said, actually somebody did, and that was. I want to say it's the guy who runs Savage Worlds. Um, so when we did the 2014, anyways, this Shane Hensley. Uh, we were doing the 2014 Amethyst, and uh, it was publishing Amethyst, the core and the factions book for multiple systems: 13th Age, Fourth Edition, Fifth Edition, uh, Pathfinder, First Edition, and uh, Savage World and Fate Core. And uh, Fate Core 
and Savage World were being done by somebody else. And since we were getting the licensing, uh, I was told specifically by um, Savage World, uh, we recommend that you split these this book in half. Uh, our fan, our our customers want smaller books. I'm not sure where the data came from, but they said our customers want smaller books. So we would like, so I we would just recommend that you split this book in half. I said, okay, fine. And so for the Savage World and only Savage World edition, we split it in half to a world guide and a player's guide. Now, having said that, it is almost a one-to-one -one sales parity between the two. I think we've sold maybe one or two player's guides over the DM's guide. Everybody always buys them both. So I felt that splitting those books was kind of pointless but i followed their advice uh, but that was the only exception um i was also told when that neurospasta was too big and we chopped about 30 or 40 pages out of that and uh i think foundations was also too big i i, I but that was under a budget from goodman games he said this book has to be i think it was 250 pages it can't be over 250 pages so i had to cut a lot of content out but a lot of it fell into factions anyway but that's when I, whenever I have to kind of follow somebody else's guidelines, I generally will fall into a budget. But if it's if I'm left to my own devices, all bets are off. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, with all that in mind, what would you? I know that these things are always in flux, but what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, just a ballpark estimation. Um, I'm always late on these things, so I gave my uh, release date as March. Uh, basically, I'll be I'll be working, starting to work with Nick on some of the ideas, and I have a lot of no, a lot of notes written out ready. So it, it's going to depend on a lot of things. Uh, the game shouldn't be that hard. The issue is going to be the novel, uh, because I made a promise to myself that the novel, the first Amethyst series, would only be five books. And technically, the first two books is another idea about talking too much. I was told by an agent to split the first Amethyst novel in half. So Aiden's Way and Controlling Chaos is supposed to be one novel. Um, but I didn't want Amethyst to go more than five books. If we if we assume Controlling Chaos and Aiden's Way are two books, then six books technically. Uh, but in order to get it to fit it into my timeline, um, there's a lot of plot. A lot of stuff has to go through. So I'm trying to figure out... If it's possible to 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 have uh, the um, the third book, Hello Kingdom, to be anything less than 500 pages, and I don't know if it's possible, so that may take me a while. Uh, but yeah, March is our assumed date. I I gave myself a few extra months because I'm always a few extra months late with all the other books. Mm -hmm. And I. If even if it means a bit of a wait, I, I would rather wait than sit, than have a rush job, so I will be keeping a close eye on on its development. Well, a rush project is forever bad. A delayed <laughs> project is eventually good. That's yeah. the old Nintendo proverb. Mm -hmm. uh, just and I whenever I bring that up, some some people bring some people bring up Duke Nukem Forever or Star Citizen. I'm like, those are the exceptions, not the rule. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and Duke Nukem was not delayed because they wanted to um, to make it better. It got delayed because no one was working on it. Uh, the actual game production uh, was actually very, very short. So that's the that's the issue with uh, those titles. Some games games that people worked on for a long time. Starter Citizen is 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 definitely an exception that you speak of because that's that that's a whole a whole project's a freaking mess. Yeah, I've. I put st I put covering that on the blacklist because I was just so sick of of dealing with all of the stupidity. I'm still amazed people are still clamoring over that. Um, it's what happens. It's what happens when you when you sell something on the belief in an idea, and I don't do faith based business. I don't even like faith healers. <laughs> no, I get you. And that problem is, is Kickstarter is part is partly on that. You're you're basically selling faith. I mean, every single Kickstarter project, even the sure thing, the th even the, the sure thing board games, are still putting faith in something that, as as at that point, doesn't yet exist. But let's also keep let's also keep in mind that this was that early wave of successful Kickstarters, mm -hmm. and 
I think in the years since, everybody's learned the lessons from the mistakes of the failures. Yeah. Some of them still get made, though. That's, that's, that's something we have to be careful of. Sturgeon's Law applies in that situation. Yeah. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Mm-hmm. And My pleasure. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yes, sir, it is. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>